Many years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, visit the land of Israel and also uh, the land of Greece on a study tour together with two professors from Emmanuel Bible College where I was finishing up a theology degree. We uh, flew out of Toronto on an Air France 747 and the first leg of that trip took us to Zurich, Switzerland. It was a rather unique flight because Air France had just changed their schedule and basically they were getting that big plane back into position and there were almost no passenger times. We were traveling with a group of 13 people and in addition to us there was a French woman with a little child about two years old and that was it. There were more crew than there were passengers on that flight. And of course the crew didn't have very much to do so they uh, kind of spoiled us. They told us we could have what we wanted to eat and they gave us a choice of you know, several fine items. And they gave us the run of the airplane. We were able to go up and down and kind of take a look at everything. And in those days, uh, when security was not such a, a big concern, they allowed us uh, one at a time or a couple at a time to go right on up into the cockpit and uh, see the pilots as they operated the aircraft. Now that was still before the digital age and uh, the whole front of the, of the cockpit was filled with dials and, and gauges of all sorts. And of course we were very appreciative of the opportunity to get up there into the cockpit. And one of the fellows that was, uh, was one of my fellow students at the theology uh, school and uh, he wanted to show his interest, you know, and, and kind of express the fact that, you know, he, he was taking advantage of this opportunity to be up in, in the front of the plane. And uh, so uh, he kind of looked at that big set of, of gauges and dials, and, he, and just at random, he put his finger on one of them, and he says to the pilot, uh, what's this? And the pilot said, that's a clock. <laughs> Now, a clock is fairly important, I suppose, if you are an airline pilot on a schedule, but it is certainly not the most important instrument in the airplane. Years ago, I took some training, some pilot uh, instruction, and as a student pilot, uh, I, uh, I learned a few things about airplanes. Now, I didn't uh, go on to get my license because at the time it came to a choice between continuing with my training as a pilot or a new motorcycle. And uh, you can pretty much guess which way I went. But I did take enough training as a pilot to learn that the most important instrument was something called an attitude indicator. If you are not a pilot, you may ask, how can a plane have an attitude? Well, the attitude of an airplane is what we call the position of the plane in relation to the horizon. When a plane is taking off, or when it is climbing, the nose of the plane is pointed above the horizon. And that's called a nose-high attitude. When an airplane is descending, it has a nose-down attitude. An extreme nose-down attitude will put a plane into a dive. <laughs> now pilots are concerned about the attitude of a plane because attitude determines the performance of the plane. And in fact, it's quite correct to say that attitude determines altitude. Changing the attitude of the aircraft changes the performance. Nose high, the plane climbs. Nose down, it's going to descend. Be careful, you may be headed for a crash. Now since the attitude of a plane determines its performance, instructors teach students attitude flying. Now what is true for an airplane is also true for people. Attitude determines altitude. Attitude may be defined as an inner feeling evidenced by behavior. An attitude can often be seen without a word being said. You know, we're all familiar with the pout of somebody that's salty, the jutted jaw of a determined person. Change your attitude, and you will change the results that you get from life. 
Just as flight instructors have a training manual, we have been given a manual for living. It's called the Bible. What does the Bible say? It says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Jesus was selfless. He was secure. And maybe most surprising of all, he was submissive. Let's take a look at each of those things. Jesus was selfless. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then, to give us the perfect example, it goes on to talk about the attitude of Jesus Christ. Selfish ambition. Selfishness is at the root of most personal and relational problems that people face. Now, selfishness is the opposite of selflessness. Our uh, culture tends to glorify selfishness oftentimes. They call it looking out for number one. Right? You gotta look out for number one. And when they talk about number one, they're talking about themselves. People who are selfish ask, what's in it for me? What will I get out of it? And then when things go wrong, as they inevitably will when you have a selfish attitude, they play the blame game. It's always somebody else's fault. And they react with outbursts of temper or with a sulk that uh, turns off the outside world. Temper tantrums and pouting are signs of selfishness and immaturity. How do you get free of selfishness? Well, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the way to overcome selfishness. I was in an office one day, the guy had a little sign on his wall that said, Me third. I thought, that's interesting. Me third. And so I commented on it. And he said, it's just a personal reminder. Jesus first, others second, me third. That's not bad. Somebody said, Jesus, then others, then you. That's how you spell joy, right? Jesus, then others, then you. So Jesus was selfless. But Jesus was also secure. In verses 6 and 7 we read, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. Even though Jesus was the Son of God and entitled to the highest position, he did not consider it something to be grasped. Entitlement gets us in trouble. A sense of entitlement. A sense of entitlement is when you say, I deserve it. You know, James and John, although they were disciples of Jesus, grasped at the highest position. Remember? They put their mother up to it. She went to uh, Jesus and she said, you know, Jesus, when you, uh, when you set up your kingdom, would you, uh, would you please have my sons, James and John, Set one on your right hand and one on your left in the most important positions of honor. Wow! Grasping for power and position. 
And what happened when the other ten disciples heard about it? The Bible says that they were indignant. Why were they indignant? Because they had their eye on that position. <laughs> At that point in their spiritual development, those disciples were still insecure, grasping for power and position. You know, human beings are born grasping. Little babies come into this world with clenched fists, with security, and with maturity, we become open-handed. The question becomes not how much can I get, but how much can I give? Philippians 4.8 talks about how we should focus and what we should think about. I got to tell you folks, when I actually got a handle on this verse or when it got a hold of me, it really changed my life. It says, finally brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I'll tell you, my natural disposition <laughs> and my uh, family situation did not program me to focus on the positive. But when I really absorbed Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, that changed my life. I began to think about things differently. I began to focus on other things. And of course, I'm still in the process. Jesus is still changing me. And then Jesus was submissive. Look at verse 8, Philippians chapter 2. It says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, the divine Son of God, humbled himself and became obedient. Those of you who have been participating in the series on Wednesday nights, Experiencing God, have been learning how closely is obedience linked to belief. How closely is obedience linked to love for God? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I say. So if you have an obedience problem, what do you really have? You have a love problem. We are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. But if we say that we love Him, and then we persistently and consistently disobey Him, we're only fooling ourselves. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? And when we think in terms of obedience, we need also to obey those whom God has placed in authority over us. You know, as a 12-year-old, Jesus spent time in the temple listening to the leaders, the spiritual leaders of that time, and asking them questions. And it says that they were astonished, they were amazed when they, when they interacted with him and his insights. And his understanding for a 12 year old. He could have been all puffed up by that experience. But when uh, Mary and Joseph came and, and brought him back, took him home, there's a verse that just struck me so strongly. I want to share it with you because it, it shows so well the attitude of Jesus at this point. Luke 2, verse 51, it says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. This is Jesus, the Son of God, but also the Son of Mary. And he was obedient to his earthly parents. And it says, His mother treasured all these things in her heart. You bet. An obedient son or daughter is a treasure to mom and dad. And then it goes on to say,
say, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. One of the things I'd like to point out here is that Jesus at this point was not a little child. He was 12 years old, going into his teen years. And through those teen years, the Bible says, he was obedient to his parents. That's a challenge for our young people to live as Jesus lived. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the extent that he was willing to be arrested, mocked, beat, stripped naked before the world, and nailed to a cross until he was dead. And what was the result of all that? Verse 9, the verse that the chapter tells us, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. It goes on to say that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If Jesus is your Savior, he must also be your Lord. Remember, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do the things that I say. Now Jesus was, and for that matter, still is, completely human. As human as you and I. But he is also, and first of all, the divine Son of God. Jesus was, and Jesus is, perfect. You and I, for sure, am a long way from perfect. But if you are a Jesus follower, His Spirit lives in you. And His Spirit is working to mold your character and your attitudes so that you become more and more like Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, this is the evidence of the Spirit in your life, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, <coughs> peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit that will be seen in your life when you submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allow His Holy Spirit to fill and control you. Ooh wouldn't want to be that kind of person. And so, at whatever stage you may find yourself spiritually today, will you decide to give Jesus Christ control of your life? Will you allow Him to forgive your sins and overcome your shortcomings and to make you a selfless, secure, and submissive person like He is? Will you allow His Spirit to make your attitude the same as that of Christ Jesus? If you want to say yes to Jesus today, yes, Jesus, I want my attitude to be the same as yours. I want to experience your forgiveness. I want to experience the fullness of your Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit will be evident in my life. If that's where you're at today, I invite you to join with me in raising your hand and saying yes. Father God, thank you that Jesus Christ is not only our perfect example, he is our Savior and he is our Lord. When he speaks, we want to do what he says. When he leads, we want to go where he calls us. We want to be selfless and secure and submissive as Jesus showed us in the way that he lived and the way that he died. And thank you, God. Thank you, Father, that you have exalted your Son to the highest place, that you have given him a name above every name, that the name of Jesus
Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We know that one day everyone will have to bow before Jesus. But how glad we are that we can voluntarily do it now. That we can submit today to your Lordship. That we can receive forgiveness for all of our sins. That we can assure ourselves by faith and obedience of a relationship with a God who loves us. Thank you, God. That we can be a part of your forever family. May the fruit of your spirit be evident in our lives today and each day, we pray. In Jesus' name. And now, may the presence, power, and peace of Jesus Christ hold you, direct